It is so good to be with you all. Uh, it's been uh, two and a half years. Last time we were here uh, for a convention was September of 2019. And uh, then there was COVID and all of that. So we are so thankful to be here and good to see all of you uh, in person and uh, hug and shake hands and all those kind of things that we used to take for granted. Um, one quick word before we look into God's word, and that is that uh, some of you were praying for us. We, we uh, pre-COVID, for years, we were meeting in a Christian school, renting a Christian school on Sundays. And then when COVID came, there was lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. And so long story short, uh, we have uh, had to meet on Zoom for the last 25 months, okay? The, you know, the school had its protocols and all that stuff, double vax and record everybody's name and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it just didn't fit very well. So we, uh, uh, God put on our hearts uh, beginning of the year to begin to pray that we could get back and the school would open up and ask some of you to pray. And so just want to let you know, uh, the Lord answered that. And uh, this past Sunday, so just three days ago, was our first time to meet together in person uh, since March of 2020. So thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. My, my goal was I was praying for uh, be able to get in there on Resurrection Sunday, uh, new life. But anyway, we had uh, triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. So <laughs> it was so good to get together. So good, so good. We never should take it for granted. You know, the Bible is true, right? Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. All right. Turn with me in your Bibles or your uh, screens, whatever, to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we want to look at, uh, the title is A Big Picture Overview of the Time Before Jesus Returns. A Big Picture Overview of the Time Before Jesus Returns. So if you like to take notes, that's the title. We'll give you some points. There'll be some scripture up on there. Uh, I was going to say we're going to walk through these first 14 verses, but actually because of time, we're going to run through them. All right. So let's read it first of all. So Matthew 24, starting at verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Holy Spirit, the Bible says that uh, you will guide us into all truth and you will show us things to come. So we ask, Lord, that this written word might become a rhema word, a living word for each of us. Show us things that we need to know in this day and for the days that are ahead. Set a watch over our mouth, Lord. Keep the door of our lips that we might speak what you would have to speak. Help us to hear what you're saying to the church today. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, This know that in the last days perilous times shall come. Know it. 
shall come. It's not going to be maybe. It's going to be shall come. So know it. Know it. Perilous times means dangerous, difficult, pressure, tribulation. Times are going to come. It's definite. It's not a maybe. All right? 2 Timothy 3.1. So Matthew 24, Jesus shocked his disciples. They said, uh, they said to him, look at all the beautiful buildings of the temple. He shocks them by saying, all this, this whole place is going to be trashed, not King James' word. It's all going to be trashed. All the stones are going to, not one left upon another. And, and those are big stones if you've ever been over to Jerusalem or seen pictures of it. They are shocked. They ask logical questions. When shall these things be? When's the temple? When's this going to happen? And then they ask two more questions, which are very valuable for us. What shall be the sign of your coming? And what shall be the sign of the coming of the end of the world? Or the Greek word is age. So what shall be the sign of the coming uh, and the end of the age? So in response, Jesus uh, gave them a number of things. And so that's why we're going to call it a big picture. It's easy to get lost in all the little details. You know, how people get fussing about end time stuff and trying to figure it all out. And everybody's got their opinion. They've written the books. They've done videos and all kinds of stuff. We just need to step back a notch and look at the big picture and say, okay, let's, let's see. What's God saying? What's Jesus saying? So this is big picture. Number one, the first thing in verses four and five, take heed that no man deceives you. There will be many saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. Now the word Christ means anointed and uh, another word for the Messiah. So Jesus says there's going to be many. I'm always interested in these words, many, many, all, all, as we go through this. Many saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. And we'd say, well, you know, I won't be deceived on something like that. I know Jesus. Well, Jesus is warning, <laughs> and he's speaking to his followers, and he's speaking to the people of his day. And uh, this definitely did happen in the time leading up to the destruction of the temple, A.D. 70. There was uh, a, a number of people, if you do some reading, that uh, claimed to be the Messiah and things like that. I'm very struck by the fact that when the disciples asked for what shall be the sign, the very first sign, the very first word that Jesus gave was take heed that no one deceive you. And three times in this passage, don't be deceived. So we need to be asking God for wisdom and discernment. Number two, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Verse six, nation, verse seven, shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You probably all know that the word nation here from the Greek is ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic. So people, group is gonna, people groups are going to rise against people groups. Kingdom against kingdom. Wars and rumors of wars. If you've ever taken a journey with uh, younger, younger children, and it's a long journey, the, the kids are, end up saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? So my question for us today is, are we there yet? Wars, rumors of wars, ethnic groups rising against ethnic groups, kingdom against kingdom. All right. In the last six months or so, we've heard rumors of war. Boom, war. And that's only one. That happens to be the one that's catching everybody's attention right now. But there's wars going on all over the place. I was reading recently, probably about 400,000 uh, people got killed in the last number of years in Sudan, in a civil war in, in Sudan and uh, Syria and wherever. All kinds of things happening. Thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of people being killed, even right now while we're sitting here. And we think we have problems, you know, with COVID, right? Um, we should not take anything for granted. Now, Jesus says, still in verse 6, see that you be not troubled. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars and nations and all ethnic things that are going on, see that you be not troubled. See that you be not frightened. NLT says, do not panic. Why? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Interesting, right? All these things, all, must come come to pass, but the end is not yet. What does that tell us? It tells us one thing. 
there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and fighting and, and ethnic conflict right up to the time when Jesus comes. Right? The end is not yet, but this is going to happen. All right? Don't be frightened, he says. So we're really going to have to rest in the Lord. And I suppose it's easy to say, do not be frightened when we're sitting here. Uh, but tell that to somebody, in a Christian in Ukraine right now, right? No wonder, Timothy, uh, the verse we started with said, perilous times shall come. Number three, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in different places. Verse seven, famines. By the way, it's all plural. Famines, plural. Pestilences, plural. Earthquakes, plural, more than one. So famines, there's many famines in various countries. We only hear about really bad ones from time to time, and we don't pay that much attention to it because, you know, the media is just bombarding us with all kinds of things. But there are a lot of famines in different places. And I'm interested that in about the last two months, the latest warnings are about food shortages, global food shortages, and people starving. Have you taken notice of that? And whether or not you like what the media says, Jesus said it. <laughs> so the media is just kind of catching up on that. Pestilences means plagues. You see the word pest in there. But here's a dictionary definition of pestilence, and I'm going to talk about it uh, very quickly at the end. Pestilence, any widespread, often fatal or contagious disease. You hear that? Any widespread, often fatal or contagious disease. So we could ask the question, are we there yet? Earthquakes, there are many, but we only hear about the really big ones that result in great destruction and loss of life. And again, Jesus says, and we need to listen to this, verse eight, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Emphasis on beginning. Sorrows here, the Greek word is birth pangs, birth pangs. Birth pangs, that's, that's the labor pains that lead up to birth of something new, all right? So, you ladies, you moms, you know that birth pains increase in frequency and intensity, and the worst ones, the most difficult ones, are just before birth, all right? So what does this tell us? This means, this is all really encouraging, isn't it? Um, this means that there's going to be an increase of all these things the closer we get to Jesus coming. It means there's going to be more famines. There's going to be more pestilences. Ah, more pestilences. More earthquakes the closer we get. Jesus says, okay, what we're reading about here, this is the beginning the beginning, and the labor pains of planet Earth are going to increase as we go. Wow. Number four, there will be affliction, hatred, persecution, betrayal, and killing of Jews and Christians, verses 9 and 10. Jesus says you, so he's talking to his disciples, Jews, you're going to be hated of all nations, all people groups, there's that word again, all people groups, are going to hate you, Jews, and for Christians for my name's sake, for Jesus' sake. And so millions of Jews and millions of Christians have been persecuted and killed all down through history, and that is increasing today. Anti-Semitism is the word for hatred of Jews. Uh, it's increasing. Jews are, any Jews that are listening are heading back to Israel, part of God's big picture plan. And uh, anti-Christian sentiment. In fact, John said in 1 John that the spirit of Antichrist uh, is already here, which is very true. And so uh, this is happening. Affliction, hatred, persecution, betrayal, killing of Jews and Christians. Number five, verse 11, Jesus gives a warning about false prophets. As I mentioned to you uh, uh, when we started, what shall be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. And he talked about false Christ, false anointings, false messiahs. Here we have false prophets, verse 11. Once again, notice the wording. 
a few false prophets? Many shall deceive a few. Many. It's amazing, isn't it? It's startling. We better be taking heed. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, 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 many. So how does this happen? Well, here's an interesting thing. Today, you can go on YouTube, you can go on Facebook, you can go anywhere on the internet, and you can find people who have visions and dreams and prophetic words. And Jesus showed me this, and Jesus told me that, and Jesus gave me this vision and all of that, okay? This has never happened before this way. Never has. Before the internet and all of that, there's still false prophets around. They would be limited to TV, right? And then before TV, they'd be even more limited to radio. And before radio, you'd have to go to a meeting somewhere to uh, hear a false prophet. In our day now, we have many, okay, many, 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 and many will be deceived because you can, uh, the, the internet is the smartest board for whatever you want. And you can uh, fill yourself up with garbage and junk food, um, or if you really sift and sort and pray, you might be able to find truth, okay? So uh, many shall be deceived and many false prophets, amazing. Now, wherever there are false prophets, there are also true prophets, okay? If there's no true prophets in these days, then Jesus would have just said, don't listen to prophets. But he said, beware of false prophets. So wherever there's false prophets, there has to be true prophets. If you look through the Bible, you find that the true prophets were in the minority, right? Old Testament, there's one true prophet, 400, uh, 400 false prophets, you know, prophets of Baal, all that sort of stuff. But um, listen, we have to remember Acts 2, 17 and 18. God says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So, we will have true prophets. And sons and daughters, people, the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking. So, big picture is this. There's going to be lots of prophesying. But Jesus says, beware of the false ones. Beware of the false ones. So we're told to test it all, right? And we know the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, 20, 21. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophecy, so don't throw it out, but prove it, test it, hold fast to what is good. And the whole thing of uh, testing prophecy is another, another topic, but basically, does it line up with scripture? Does the prophet point us to God and to Jesus? You find that in Deuteronomy 13. Does the prophecy come to pass, Deuteronomy 18? I mean, that's a no-brainer. Uh, people are prophesying these days, and anybody that sets a date and names a name and says, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, all you need to do is just wait. And these days, all you need to do is wait a few months, a year, two, at the very most, and you find out whether somebody is really hearing God or not. So it doesn't come to pass. And also, what is the fruit of the prophet's life? Matthew 7, 15. There's Jesus again. I'm amazed at this. Beware of false prophets. Why does Jesus keep on saying that, saying that, saying that? Beware of false prophets. And then he says, by their fruit, uh, you shall know them. All right, let's keep going. Number six, because of great sin, this is verse 12, because of great sin and wickedness and evil and rebellion and lawlessness, many followers of Jesus are going to turn away from their faith. Notice this, because... Iniquity, iniquity means sin and lawlessness and rebellion, will abound, that means increase and multiply, the love for God of many will grow cold. Matthew 24, 12. Fact, iniquity, sin, lawlessness, rebellion is going to abound, that means a lot, it means multiply, it means increase in the days leading up to Jesus' second coming. Are we there yet? Every day you look at something 
in the media or government, and you say, how can this be? What is going on? Every day there's some iniquity, there's lawlessness, there's insanity, if you think biblically. And you just say, this is an epidemic, okay? You can talk about a, a physical pandemic, but we have a pandemic of sin and iniquity and lawlessness. And if we aren't careful, we get focused on the physical one and forget the most important one, the spiritual one. It's going to abound, it's going to increase, and what's going to happen? People who once followed the Lord, people that we've worshipped with, people we've been with, people, even family members, the, the, the pressure is going to be so great, right? Perilous times shall come, pressure times. And they're going to grow cold, grow cold. And we've seen it happen, and unfortunately, according to this, we're going to see more of it. All right, Lord, help us to hold steady here. Verse 13, great grace, endurance, and patient perseverance is going to be required. He that endures to the end shall be saved. All right, those are six things that are very challenging. Number seven is the encouraging one, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Once again, we've got all and we've got ethnic groups. So this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, not maybe, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all people groups, then shall the end come. And Mark 13, 10 says this gospel must first be preached. So no matter how you cut it, the gospel has to be preached, must be preached, shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. So we hear about end time harvest. Here it is. But it's going to happen as the gospel is preached in all the world to all ethnic groups. And as you know, um, there's a lot of languages that don't have the Bible yet. So we've got a big project. What does Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach, proclaim the gospel to everyone, Mark 16, 15, and then go and teach, make disciples of all nations. So we've got that twofold responsibility, go and preach, go and make disciples. And uh, Zion's mantle mainly is go teach, make disciples, Bible school in every nation. And, and that kind of thing is, COVID has done us a favor in that regard, right? Now we can, we can Zoom <laughs> all over the world um, without leaving our house. It's amazing. Uh, a, a prophetic word was given to me back in, oh, I don't know, a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago and said, you'll not be held by the boundary of any country. Okay, uh, you know, that's cool. I guess there's traveling on the agenda here, and I've been to a few countries, but I sat in my office and taught Bible school in Philippines. Who would have thunk it, right? Well, you know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it wasn't happening. Now it happens. Sat in my office and taught here in New York. Uh, amazing, right? So the sky's the limit, the, the, the world's the limit, so to speak, now. This gospel must be preached in all nations. Then shall the end come. Then shall the end come. So all the people that say, well, Jesus can come back tonight, and I say this very carefully, advisedly, but you understand. No, the gospel has to be preached. Then shall the end come. Got to handle that very carefully, very wisely, very carefully, but you understand. All right, so here's the thing. When wars and viruses are on everybody's mind these days, there are more opportunities than ever to talk to people about Jesus and about the Bible. I don't know if you've found it. I have found it. It's amazing. If you just at the beginning of the day say, Lord, I'm available to uh, speak for you today. I'm available to engage in conversation. I'm a willing, I'm available to start a conversation. And, and the main conversations these days are wars and COVID. Right? And so I say to people uh, in a nice way, do you know anything about the Bible? And let's face it, most people don't. In North America, most people don't. And they don't like to admit it, maybe, but uh, sometimes they say, well, not much. And, then, and, the, and you don't preach a sermon, but you just take two or three minutes, if it's on the job or in the store, wherever it is, and say, well, the Bible talks about, and then you can mention any of these things out of Matthew 24 or Revelation or whatever. And like, especially everybody's concerned about vaccinations and marks and 
all this sort of stuff, the mark of the beast and all that, you can share what the Bible says about it, okay? Share what the Bible says. There, there are so many opportunities. Here's the main thing though, don't get sidetracked on endless speculation and conspiracy theories and all that because the uh, devil will take you off track on uh, all that stuff. Just keep bringing the conversation back to Jesus, back to the Bible and plant the seeds and say, Lord, there it is. All right, number eight, uh, Jesus' final warning, keep spiritually alert. And this is in the end of uh, Matthew 24, but verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord will come. Verse 44, be ready for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man shall come. Verse 45, be a faithful and a wise servant. And over in Luke 21, 34 through 36, do not get overloaded with the cares and the affairs of this life, lest that day come upon you unawares. Watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the earth. All right. That wasn't a bad overview, was it? Okay, um, I want to finish off in the last few minutes here with a few biblical thoughts about pestilence. Pestilence. Pestilence is mentioned 49 times in the Bible, King James, and um, 47 of those are in the Old Testament. Two are in the New Testament. One is here, Matthew 24, 7. The other one is in Luke 21, 11, both in the context of the last days. So, Old Testament root meaning of the word pestilence. It means destroy, destroy, destroying. That can be, you see the word pest in there. Uh, there's also the thought of plagues. But as I mentioned earlier, and if you didn't catch it, then you catch it now. The dictionary says, this secular dictionary, any widespread, infectious, contagious, often fatal disease. Pestilence, any widespread, infectious, contagious, often fatal disease. And the Hebrew background root, destroy, plague. So I did some research here on pestilence, and it's pretty interesting. You can chase it down. Uh, in the Bible, pestilence are spoken of, generally speaking, as being sent by God as a judgment on continuous, ongoing sinfulness against him and his laws. I'll say it again. In the Bible, pestilence, generally speaking, spoken of as being sent by God as a judgment on continuous, ongoing sinfulness against him and his laws. And by the way, I'm saying on a, on a big picture scale, like on the country and uh, on the nations, things like that. Pestilences are not spoken of as being caused by people or coming from the devil. This might mess up some people's thinking here. So I'm saying big picture, don't forget, big picture. Don't get lost in all the fine details trying to sort it all out, as whether it came from a lab or a bat or whoever. Big picture, okay, big picture, keep it in mind. Big picture, not spoken of as being caused by people or from the devil. Here's a few examples real quick. You might just have time to jot down the, the uh, scripture. God says to Pharaoh, I will smite your people with pestilence. Exodus 9, 14 to 16. People, uh, Egypt had a hard-hearted leader who refused and rejected God. God says, I'll smite your people. So all of us are affected by ungodly leaders. Whoa. God says to Israel, if you disobey my commandments, I'll send pestilence among you. Leviticus 26, 25. And God spoke through Jeremiah and he spoke through Ezekiel, continually warned about famines, sword, which would be war, and pestilence. And uh, you can check out Jeremiah 14, 12, Jeremiah 21, 6, Ezekiel 5, 12. Here's a verse out of Ezekiel 14, 21 that's worth looking at. God says, I will send my four severe judgments, the sword, which is war, famine, wild animals, and pestilence. Ezekiel 14, 21. He's got four severe judgments that he uses. All right? Sword, famine, wild animals, and pestilence. Unless we're still thinking about this thing of, are these things man-made or from the devil or what? Just think about this, the plagues in Revelation. When you read Revelation, just take notice of it. The plagues in Revelation are sent by God. 
It is true. The plagues in Revelation are sent by God. Revelation 9, 20, Revelation 15, verse 1, 6, and 7, and Revelation 16, 9, and 21. So uh, you've all heard people rebuking the devil and all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, when it comes to plague, uh, pestilence, and things like that. You've heard all kinds of interesting prophetic words, at least I have, uh, about it. And you just say, hmm, let's see now. And uh, that's what causes us to look then into the Bible. And what does the Bible say? And I was very interested that... Uh, it doesn't say that Satan brought the pestilence, okay? Now, what does it say? It means that God is in control of all of these things. So since God is in control of all of these things, what is his remedy? That's, that's what we need to finish off on here. So 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. Uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we know very well. If my people which are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face. Okay, we don't pay attention to verse 13. So here's verse 13, God speaking, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, there's our famine, if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Whoa, does God, if I send pestilence, so we're talking, please don't misinterpret this as, as a condemnation for individuals. This is a nationwide thing. God says, if I send pestilence on the nation, okay? on the nation. Then verse 14, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What does that speak of? National repentance, national returning to God, nationwide repentance, nationwide returning to God. Okay, God says if I stop it from raining and and send locusts and uh, send a pestilence. The remedy for it is national repentance. My, if my people and and we don't don't limit it to you know just us Christians, a small group. It, this is speaking to the nation. God's speaking to the nation here, His people. So again, if you know somebody gets sick of COVID or whatever it might be, that's this is this verse is not a con condemnation on that. This is on our whole big picture, and in your country and in mine, we have not seen our government leaders repenting at all. Uh, the only thing they know what to do is throw more money at it, and uh, more, more vaccinations, and more this, and more that, and more lockdowns, and more. You know, we're in our sixth wave now, you know, isn't that wonderful? Sixth wave, okay? Why is that? It's because there's been no repentance nationwide. I'm talking about nationwide, okay? I'm not talking about individuals, local church, wherever it is, but nationwide government leaders are not repenting. A lot of spiritual leaders are not repenting. Uh, they're still wasting their time, if you understand me correctly, rebuking the devil when the devil didn't send this one. God sends pestilence, okay? Think about that. I know it messes with some theology in the body of Christ these days, but clearly the remedy for pestilence is national repentance and turning to God. So... This has not yet happened, and the pestilence continues. Everybody said? Amen. Hmm, yeah, amen. <laughs> All right. So what does this mean? We're going to have to seek God. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Don't forget, the wheat and the tares have to grow up together. All right? The wheat and the tares grow up together. So the best is yet to come, and we also have not yet seen the worst. Sorry. <laughs> the best is yet to come, but we've not seen the worst. Jesus is going to rise in the power in his people. Antichrist is going to rise. We read the end of the book. We know who's going to win. But in the meantime, there's a song that says, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. So run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. All right, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us a roadmap. We thank you for the written word. We thank you that you have shown us everything that we need to know. And uh, Lord, sometimes we overstep that and wanna, wanna get into things that uh, you haven't told us yet. So uh, thank you that in your word is everything that pertains to life and godliness. We wanna hear your voice. 
We ask you to give us great discernment and wisdom in these last days. Give us discerning of spirits. Uh, we ask that you just bless each of us, uh, in particular as spiritual leaders, to know how to instruct, how to encourage, how to uh, minister to people as we walk through difficult times. Indeed, perilous times are here and are yet to come. And so, Lord, being um, forewarned is forearmed, and uh, you want to equip us to be good soldiers, to stand firm no matter what goes on. And we'll thank you for it. Write this word upon our hearts, Father, and help us to use it to bless other people and uh, opportunities to share Jesus in these days more than ever before. Amen.